So thanks again, and without further ado, the floor goes to Alexander and then to Yeromi. So thanks a lot. Thank you as well. And please give us good evaluations. Um, and uh, hopefully no earthquake as we speak. Uh, um, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure being here back again. Well, first time in this building, actually. Uh, but pleasure being invited back by ICAS. Um, and I, um, I'm particularly, I think, uh, proud because we have uh, this funny topic today, today to discuss. Um, I need to give you disclosure that whatever I'm going to say uh, today is not representative of my firm. I work for Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer. I'm a lawyer here in town. Uh, my official title is Head of Sanctions for Asia. Um, so I do a lot of work for clients uh, throughout Asia on various sanctions questions and points and matters. But I, I, today I'm in my personal capacity with the knowledge that I gained. It's tricky. Um, the topic today that I will cover, uh, I will start um, maybe not too controversially. Um, I will go through law. So those of you who want to take a nap, uh, please do. I'll wake you up when I finish with the legal background. Um, but law and regulatory is very important to set the stage, obviously, I think, for this presentation. Um, so that's me, my title, and my phone number, my email. Um, if you have a, a, any tricky question, uh, uh, let me know. But um, today, um, I will try to cover, I have about 20 somewhat minutes, um, and I think we'll open the photo questions once we finish, but please do raise your hand if you have something that's unclear. And I'm sure a lot of the stuff I'm gonna be telling you today will uh, probably uh, raise some eyebrows and questions. I'm happy to address them. But three topics really to cover today from my side um, to set the stage for today's presentation. Uh, to give you a basic overview of US sanctions, again, those of you who are familiar, take a nap. Um, but then to sections two and three are really more recent developments, uh, and specifically from the US side, the trade wars, and then the response from China uh, on the trade wars and tariff wars. Um, so there we go. Section one. Uh, your sanctions, sanctions are coming. Mr. President, uh, President Trump has been using the sanctions uh, quite widely. Um, they've existed for many, many years, but he's really um, made a big um, use of them. And this is how they work. Uh, I mean, to be frank, the US sanctions are extremely flexible. Um, and the policy and procedures that are in place can really vary. Uh, and you can see that the, kind of the, policy, the foreign policy goals, they are fairly vague uh, concepts, anything goes. The types of sanctions and measures, this is where we're gonna spend a bit more time, talk about how they actually work, and they'll separately talk about export controls, because that's where we'll talk about China, how it falls into this picture. And then the typical sanctions targets, um, the way, you know, they, they kind of work in categories where you have SDNs, what we call, if you someone, you name someone to be a bad guy, uh, as Trump said, uh, bad hombres, uh, that's the SDNs. And then the blocked entities and countries and, and regions, etc. this is kind of the, the, the realm of sanctions. And then they can be issued by multiple entities, but not just the US. So the UN historically has been an entity that it has the sanctions within a uh, category within its Security Council, but also um, you, s you know that EU member states have issued sanctions. Japan here has its own sanctions regimes. So there's a lot of sanctions and counter sanctions. It's, it's a world of sanctions. Very exciting for people like me who do it uh, because it keeps us busy. Now, um, these are the flags, uh, as we stand today, or from the U.S. side, who are the main target countries, uh, really. And uh, Iran, Russia, North Korea, Cuba, Syria, Venezuela, those are all the names you see pretty much on the news quite a lot. Um, so it's in a way, it's kind of cool because we do this area of law and regulation where, you know, we kind of have to wake up every morning and I check my email uh, whether Trump has done anything crazy uh, again because we, we, we kind of need to see what's going on. And oftentimes you can't predict uh, Trump's actions, but also uh, all of these regimes are really evolving. Uh, very briefly, Iran had, had a full U-turn, uh, was okay up until Trump. Now it's not okay, not, not open for business. Russia, I won't even go there. We need vodka and a lot more time to discuss Russia. Uh, North Korea is very clear. I think everyone agrees on North Korea that it's a bad guy, except for Trump, I think, has other um, um, understanding of the situation. 
Cuba is not relevant uh, for us here, Syria either. Venezuela, interestingly, for a lot of Japanese clients, has been a concern because of oil industry uh, and some of the investments in Venezuela. Critically, Washington DC has had its share of uh, concerns, and I won't preempt my the next speaker, but all I can say that you know we've seen in the work that we do that a lot, lot of people who have been sanctions experts that have left now the government to either move to private practice or do something else, just because of uh, their role as a government employees have really been challenged. Um, now, this, this slide is really important because I need to get you all to understand how this law works. Uniquely, US sanctions can apply to anyone. So the first category, the primary sanctions, they're going to make sense. They require some kind of US nexus, whether it's um, uh, you know, US person, you know, entity, or whether you are in the US. So for instance, my example, if you want to take your child to um, Disney World in the US, for the duration of your trip, you become a US person, and so it's subject to primary sanctions. If anyone here likes Celine Dion, or wants to go to see Celine Dion in Las Vegas, the same thing, you're gonna become, while you're listening to Celine Dion, you are a US person, and you're subject to primary sanctions. So don't answer your emails. Uh, now, the, the, the critical part is here. So, so those of us here who are not US persons, I'm a Canadian, so I'm not a US person. So those of us who are not US persons and have no connection to the US, we're still subject to what's called secondary US sanctions. No other country in the world has this concept. Basically, US can impose sanctions on, on, on Iran, let's say, North Korea, and, and tell the world, if you're gonna be doing business with these people or these countries, we will put you on the blacklist and then no one will want to work with you. And the way it works ultimately, the banks will be the ones who will enforce sanctions. The banks will be, we don't want to be dealing with anyone here. So it's very, very tricky. Sanctions compliance becomes very difficult because again, this is a unique concept and you need to know whom you're dealing with, whether these people are on any of these lists. Now, this is an example where people get in trouble. Use of US dollars puts you in a category of primary sanctions. So the primary sanctions that are applicable to US persons and US law are much wider in scope. So as a Japanese company, so let's say my example here, Hong Kong company wants to pay for Thai goods uh, in US dollars, typically energy or anything else is you typically paid in US dollars. They will typically be cleared in the US. So when dollars, let's go, let's say dollars go from Hong Kong to Bangkok, that route will be via US. Once they touch the US, they become US, um, subject to US primary sanctions, and it's a lot of categories where you really become uh, very tricky. And we see clients get in trouble in this category. Now, the penalties are crazy, to be honest with you, because um, people talk about bribery and corruption as being an area of concern, but actually the highest penalties have been in the sanctions category, and particularly paid by banks. So the famous uh, BNP Paribas, uh, $9 billion fine paid to US authorities, that's nothing that has matched it even closely. And the concern here obviously is for the banks that all this, all this can mul multiply to billions of dollars. And uh, nearly um, twice a week or thrice a week we see announcements by OFAC about new settlements with various entities. Um, so again, a lot of money. You can also go to prison if you do something bad. So um, don't, don't violate sanctions, and if you do, call me. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get, get this opening to get to here, because today we really wanted to focus on, on kind of this new area of uh, concern, really, around the US-China trade war, and it really works through US export controls. I have to be honest with you, this is an area where it's extremely detailed and complicated. So what I'm going to try to tell you very briefly the way it works is, U.S. can impose uh, certain restrictions on goods that are produced in the U.S., U.S. origin, or goods that have con a content from the U.S. And there are multiple categories, countries where the, these goods can go, companies where these goods can go, or not. And the way it works is basically, there's, there's all these entities that regulate this. Uh, particularly for IT, technology, and software, those are really the areas of concern for the US. They don't want their goods, their technology, to end up in Iran or end up in North Korea, and now China. 
So the export control, again, scope and reach are quite wide, and as you can see. And I think the, the concern here is, again, I don't want to go through all these categories, but you, you can imagine uh, you know, a typical um, a US product that's going to go from the US and being imported anywhere in the world. It will have to be cleared through one of these clearances. For most part, they're automatic. So this is where it's going to become tricky with, with, with Huawei in China, because that's where that automatic clearance is no longer available, because Huawei became now a listed entity. Uh, and and we, we see this also, uh, and I'll talk about the GE example, where that's how they got in trouble. They were exporting something out of the US and selling to entities that were not, or countries that were not really eligible for to receive those goods and technology. Um, Subject to the EAR, ITAR, again, look, any US origin item, items produced outside of the US with more than de minimis content. Now, this is where it comes to us in Asia. So let's take an example of a Japanese company buying a US technology or software and then incorporating it its own manufacturing and then selling it to China. The problem is that the US has this rule of 25%. Um, so the de minimis percentage here, for instance, typically is 25%. So anything that has US content uh, that applies to this, will have, over 25%, will be subject to these rules and have to be cleared by one of the uh, available ways to clear it. The concern is, how do you know necessarily, you know, and how do you calculate? Well, I won't answer you this question because that's a lot of money um, to tell you. But, but to be honest with you, it's a very, very tricky question. If you imagine a big manufacturer, any big Japanese company, you typically have now US and China being two biggest markets. So for all of our major companies here, those are the key markets. And typically, the goods go kind of flow from one to another. So a lot of Chinese produced goods go to the US or vice versa. And they can go via Japan or might not. So with all of this now coming into play, and Huawei in particular being the focus of the sanctions, it, it creates a, an important element where for third parties, uh, countries like us here in Japan, our clients now, our companies now, have to be almost making a choice. What do they do? Do they follow US rules? Do they follow Chinese rules? And specifically for the flow of goods and supply chains. Now, um, Penalties, I'm not going to, again, go through this. It's a lot of money that can cost you per violation. Look at half a million dollars per violation. And it's, you, know, you can get, end up in, tr in prison if you violate the law. Uh, I mean, the rules are very, very, very strict. Uh, and again, it, it applies cross-jurisdictionally. I mean, all of us here will be subject to these to this rules. What I wanted to, to really get to, uh, and again, uh, let me pause here, maybe, Robert, if that's okay, to see if there are any questions, because I'm going to run through a lot of information um, in 10 minutes. Are there any questions about the basics of the export controls and sanctions? Or shall I go on? Go on, okay. So the trade wars, this is really the fun stuff. This is where it gets controversial. Um, US and China have multiple weapons. Um, to um, really use um, to in this trade slash tariff war. And I put on top for the US side the sanctions, export controls, and CFIUS. CFIUS is another category where uh, I haven't discussed this carefully, but actually CFIUS is another area where um, you, you know, US, US authorities will have to give you an approval for certain transactions if they have an element of US security. So I'll give an example, a Japanese company was selling its asset in Italy. An asset was a manufacturer of uh, windows, and some of those windows were for Pentagon building. Well, US authorities said you can't sell it to Chinese, even though it has nothing to do with the US directly, but you can't. So this is where the approvals had to be sought and were not even given. Now, the, the, there's, there is a few more things happening now. So th those things, the sanctions, export control, CFS, they've exist existed for a while. Now, what Trump has done, and I think it's my next slide, um, I, I'll, I'll get to it in, in order. So this is kind of the menu of options. And you can see how in the Washington, you have these multiple ideas from, the, from kind of the, the presidential side. Uh, we'll, I'll talk about the review, that, that fourth category there. But also, there are, there are congressional bills that are now in place, and I, I, I listed them there. The equitable bill, equitable, equitable bill 
uh, that requires Chinese companies who are on the US stock exchange to disclose their information about what's happening in China. Because typically, um, if you have two conflicting laws, the Chinese company can say, we can provide you some information because it's subject to our secrecy or some other rules in, in China. But that bill will require you to disclose everything. Now, there's a lot of going on. What's interesting is this is where probably Robert will get most interesting, the geopolitical influence over the allies. It's like a soft power, you know, so all this regulatory stuff is great, but actually US can call up their allies in, in Berlin and in, in Prague and London and say, well, we don't want you to be business with Huawei. We, we think or we believe or we have information that Huawei has, um, uh, Huawei leaks uh, information back to Chinese authorities. So if they're going to be in your 5G, uh, they're going to be able to get some of the uh, very sensitive military information, and that information can then be transferred to Chinese authorities and military. We don't want it to happen. That actually, um, you know, I don't know, or I don't have that information whether it's true or not. But to be frank, um, the, the way we see this 5G con concern, especially for Huawei, uh, they are ahead of the game vis-a-vis uh, -vis many American companies. And maybe there is a, there is a, there is an, there is a concern or the ability from the American um, lobbying machine to really curtail Huawei's advancements. And this is one of the ways. I'm just throwing it out there, and we can talk about it later. Um, the countermeasures by China, it's actually amazing to see. China is obviously has grown to be a mighty power economically and can, can really uh, kind of fight back in, its, in a sense for some of the stuff that's happening that the US can try and maybe bully it as, as, they, as they perceive it. And they've come up with come up a few ideas of their own, including the second, the second point there, the unreliable entities list. It's a funky name to say, if you're a company that's following US law to the detriment of Chinese interests, other governmental or private interests. You're gonna become an unreliable entity for our purposes, and we're gonna put you on some, our own list, and we're gonna deny you various uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, contracts, et cetera. So ha does anyone of you know which is the first company that's gonna be on this list? It's FedEx. So FedEx denied, uh, well, FedEx had to follow those rules and say, we can't um, send or deliver to Huawei so certain elements, certain products from the US, or we don't know if they have US element, we, we, we don't know, we'd rather not do anything. So, so Chinese authorities said, wait a second, you, like, you have a contract with our, um, with our company, and now you become unreliable for our purposes. This is all, all of this is kind of pending, actually. So a lot of this is evolving, because um, while, when Trump was here in Osaka, he made certain announcements to indicate that Huawei will be um, kind of, you know, given a bit of a, um, um, you know, easier um, time, except for when he came back to the US, it didn't happen, really. And I will talk about how this works. But before Huawei was ZTE, and this is where it became quite interesting because it was before the real trade war, before this big announcements, before this, this entity list, et cetera. And ZTE was, got in trouble with the US authorities for violating both export controls and sanctions. I mean, to, to cut a long story short, they were basically buying US technology and then incorporating it in its own goods or selling it directly to Iran and North Korea. They admitted to doing this, paid $1 billion fine, and then promised to the US authorities to clean up their act. Well, they lied. They didn't do it. So then the, they, they got, the US authorities said, wait a second, you can't lie to us, so we're going to deny you any ability to work with any of the US goods. And we, the way we're going to deny you is any company in the world should not be doing business with you unless you can prove to them that it has nothing to do with the US. Well, they can't prove it. So can you imagine my client, the big telecom, um, and ZTE basically conducts the entire network in the country for, this, for my client. And would, on April 15 or 16, whatever it was, we wake up with this denial order. They can't operate their network. It's crazy, actually, because ZTE literally denial order meant you could not do anything with them. Well, they found a way to pay the fine um, through lobbying in other ways, which was another billion dollars and they're off the list. So um, there are multiple stories about how they were able to do this, but um, ultimately they paid $2 billion and they're okay to do business with now, now with Huawei. 
So Huawei is very different. There are pending um, concerns about Huawei, and they haven't really been, well, th there's no clear allegations. There are allegations that they have been, again, um, uh, violating some of the U.S. export controls and sanctions rules. Uh, as a Canadian, I was very concerned that, you know, the you know, Huawei CFO, uh, her hearings are this week, actually, in Vancouver, whether she's going to be released or not, we don't know. Um, but ultimately, the, the concern here, again, there's kind of triple concern there. The U.S.-China trade war overall big picture in this, um, in, you know, in the world where we have two now competing superpowers economically. The 5G standards, 5G obviously, whoever wins the 5G race will be very, very wealthy. And Huawei seems to be ahead of the game, uh, technologically speaking. And then long-running national security and espionage concerns, those are described earlier where US says, we don't believe Huawei to be independent, we think they're leaking information to the Chinese authorities. Now, Criminal, I don't really want to scare you, but this is a lot going on here. Um, so what happened was this year, um, President Trump uh, made this executive order, uh, which basically said, we're going to create this new review system. A new review system will basically say, for any of the information and, te and communication technology services uh, that is sold uh, or made available to a foreign adversary, we need to review it and approve it before it can be made so. Well, who is foreign adversary? That's a question that no one has an answer for. We should know the answer on around 15 of October. But can you imagine if any country were to be actually named a foreign adversary? That's a huge step. So we don't really know how this is going to play out and who's going to be named as a foreign adversary. But that's really a, a new system of review that's going to come into play literally in a few weeks. Um, so, and it will impact, uh, even though it does have a U.S. element, again, because of the virtue of the export controls, where there are rules that you incorporate U.S. goods, it will impact people and companies that have nothing to do with the U.S., because they have to do the testing and, and figure out how it works. Um, now, the entity list here, this is a different, uh, different animal altogether. The entity list is relates, to, relates to the export controls regulations. So Huawei, uh, as a Chinese entity, uh, historically was able to get uh, nearly automatically uh, permissible um, goods and services and software from the US. They added Huawei on the same day to this entity listing, which means that you cannot, if you have US technology, goods or services, you cannot export it to Huawei unless you have a license, and no one will give you a license because it's Huawei. So it's very tricky because uh, Huawei is now an institution where it can't likely receive anything that has U.S. component over 25 percent. Nothing really can come directly from the U.S. Uh, it creates a lot of uh, concerns. There are some temporary licenses that were extended. They don't really give much um, um, leeway to Huawei, to be honest. People, again, are, are very cautious about all of this. Um, Huawei said that they have enough of technology of their own that has nothing to do with the U.S. technology that they can sell and, and take care of. Um, they also stockpiled quite a lot in, in anticipation of this. So they say that they're key to the business. Now, concern is, again, um, so I do have a client, uh, again, it's, it's the same telecom client where Huawei basically operates their networks in multiple countries. Well, the question is, for each and every item received from Huawei, the client now has to kind of get an understanding is this legally purchased? Is this, does it have U.S. content? Can we use it? Can Huawei use it? Can, can we use it? It becomes really, really tricky, guys. Um, and typically, uh, hard to find answers, to be honest. Um, I wanted to talk to you in a few words about China, how it responded. Um, and to be frank, its response is still uh, pending, uh, meaning that you know there hasn't been really kind of the major escalation of trade wars. But what China has done very smartly, they put uh, down the foundation, the legal foundation, for uh, a really uh, strong response, if they have to do it, to the US measures. And again, the, the unreliable entity list is the strongest element that, that you can imagine. Because if you're a big corporation, um, any big Japanese co corporation, you're definitely doing business in China. If you're on that list, 
you might be prevented from doing it. I mean, I put there what it means to be on that list. You, you will be blacklisted from a lot of, um, from ability to be in China. Um, I think the, the for some of the companies that, that are um, bigger Japanese companies, it's particularly tricky because, again, you have two big markets. You have US market and you have Chinese market. And what we're seeing now is the conflict of laws. Uh, on the one hand, US say, don't play with China. On the other hand, China says, if you're going to do anything that's against our interests, we're going to put you on our blacklists. You really, you really have a situation where, which hasn't been historically the case, where two major economies are really competing. And I think it will really have an impact on us here and our companies in Japan, because we can stuck in between. It's much easier for a Chinese company to kind of move away from US, from US company to move away from China maybe, but it's much more difficult for Japanese companies that have those two markets as their prime domains. Um, the impact, I mean, who may be impacted? I mean, any company uh, that adjusts commercial relationships with PRC companies as a result of US export controls. Uh, it's a really broad um, um, uh, definition. Consequences are not clear. They, they're going to be, again, I think this is like a warning shot. It's a foundation for, uh, un, in legally speaking, to be able for China to respond. Look, we, we've seen similar uh, elements with um, two other regimes uh, in sanctions. One is uh, against Russia. So when Russia uh, was facing all the sanctions, they put together their own um, law, which is called the law against uh, unfriendly entities. And they were very simple. It's that any American citizen and any American company is an unfriendly entity, period. Well, that's a big, big, colorful language, but actually, legally speaking, didn't mean much. Uh, not yet. Um, the other situation which we saw uh, recently with Iran, when you asked, when Trump decided to withdraw from the Iranian deal, the Europeans said, wait a second, we don't want to withdraw from the Iranian deal. We believe the deal is fair. Iran followed its own obligations. So we're going to ensure that we work with Iran. But the tricky part is, again, if US says we're out of Iranian deal and we impose secondary sanctions on Iran, secondary sanctions will mean anyone in the world should not be doing the business with Iran. So what happened with the, with the Europeans, they have those called blocking regulations. And it's very similar working the way they work. If a, if a European company uh, withdraws from a business with another European company because of US law, uh, which is not applicable, should not be applicable to Europeans, to the detriment of the European company, there might be uh, repercussions. Um, there haven't been many, but again, it's, it's all about law and how it's putting the foundation. Uh, I don't want to go through all of this because I think there's more fun things to talk about. But I'm going to just kind of put this last slide here, um, in look, looking into the f future. Um, again, I think for many of us here and clients of mine that, that, that are thinking about this kind of the big picture US-China trade war, Trump being unpredictable, China putting into um, law the foundation for countermeasures, they have to really think about all of their structure business-wise, but also legally-wise. They have a plan B if Huawei is no longer a potential partner, if China is no longer a potential um, uh, uh, you know, counterparty, who can, who can come in? A lot of this is really, um, you know, I put the last point there, a period, period of uncertainty. Uh, in business, uncertainty is not a great thing. Uh, we want to be certain about the future, want to be able to be certain because we can run businesses. Uh, and this is really, really, really not good. Um, so I think we're at a time where we're going to see a lot more developments, um, but hopefully nothing major. Uh, but but I'm, again, I try to give you the kind of the law uh, so you can think think about um, when we move to politics. Um, this is it for me, actually, um, Robert. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for. Um inviting me to this uh, uh, interesting panel. Um, I'm very honored to be here. And, uh, it's an honor for us to be here. <laughs> and Robert asked me to, to talk about uh, impact on, broader impact on Japan, so I'll try to do that. So let's see. Um, 
Okay, uh, definitely uh, this U.S.-China trade um, war is pushing down the world economy. Uh, if you look at this IMF um, estimate uh, of uh, July to 2019 and uh, April 2019, the difference, parentheses, is the difference between the, uh, those two uh, estimates. So actually between three, four months, this uh, estimate has changed. Uh, this is mainly due to uh, intensified U.S.-China trade war. So you can see uh, Japan 1.1 down, China 0.1 down, and especially China, uh, the second quarter, the lowest growth uh, term since 1992, and the U.S. economy was up 0.3%, but uh, Germany uh, is down, um, probably heading to recession. And then also Korea, because of uh, uh, heavy dependence on the export. Uh, they have been hit so hard. And also Japan is a uh, plus, but it's still affecting export and, a, and investment uh, because of the uncertainty. So especially Germany and Korean uh, um, economy is dependent on uh, export. Uh, that's why uh, they're hitting so hard. And if you look at this is the uh, dependency on the export, um, Japan is relatively low, which is like 14% or so. But if you look at um, German, Germany and um, South Korea, they are like a 40%. This is a 2015 figure, so maybe a little higher now, for over 40%. Uh, they're relying on <clears throat> export on their economy. And especially uh, German um, uh, is... Uh, that China is uh, a number two trading partner for Germany, so it's, it's quite uh, big for them. And uh, what is most affecting is high-tech industries. Um, if you look at the uh, South Korea and uh, Taiwanese firms, they hit pretty hard. If you compare to 2018 first half and 2019 first half, the Korean, uh, South Korean uh, firms hit so hard, uh, min negative 42%. And Taiwanese firm also hit um, negative 25%, so mainly uh, semiconductor parts and so on. Okay, if you, um, a lot of people talk about global supply chain, and then if you really look into the figures, it's actually that the value add added um, component is is pretty low. For instance, Japanese contribution, um, like for instance, if you you know Japan export to China and then China you know assembly assembly and then you know eventually China sent to U.S. market. But if you look at the total amount of uh, export and then input amount, it's only 1.7 percent. Uh, Japan is only one. so the, the actual uh, impact of of having this global supply chain uh, affecting because of the U.S.-China trade war is not so much. Uh, but in case of, um, you know, uh, it's coming in, in December, you know, PCs and game equipment and smartphones, they have more inputs uh, coming from Japan, so there will be a little more um, impact uh, to uh, those parts makers. And then um, Chinese export to U.S. has declined 10% uh, compared to 2018, and U.S. export to China also declined 20%. Um, so, um, and then, you know, these days global supply chain is, is getting uh, um, fully established these days, and then, the, I mean, it's increasingly irrelevant to uh, look at the originating nation. Like, if you uh, look at this, um, Japanese firms in the Philippines, uh, they're exporting parts to South Korea, but South Korea firms uh, moved to Vietnam uh, productions, and then eventually what happened is, is the parts exported from Philippines to Vietnam. So those uh, statistics uh, doesn't show as a, uh, uh, as a Japanese firm. It's, uh, it's the trade between Philippines and Vietnam, but actually the Japanese parts are exported and traded. So. Um, this is what uh, happens, and therefore, the increasingly, that uh, originating nation and then the, the trade statistic between nations are um, making not uh, not making sense these days. So, and then what uh, pushing down the uh, Japanese um, economy by this U.S.-China trade war is, uh, as Alexander talked about, it's uh, uncertainty. 
uh, uncertainty uh, drives uh, manufacturing industry to, to reluctant on investment. So that's uh, driving down the uh, their mindset, and that's the most uh, biggest uh, impact for uh, from this U.S.-China trade war onto Japanese um, uh, mindset. And uh, for Japan. Um, the more grave uh, concern is the global economic plunge uh, because of, you know, triggered by U.S.-China US trade war. And then if you remember Lehman shock, uh, that uh, damaged Japan and South Korea uh, pretty, uh, pretty hard. So this is the uh, um, graph uh, right after the uh, Lehman shock. Uh, Japanese export plunged. And also, yen substantially appreciated for five years, and this is what uh, Japan got. So if the global economic plunge happens, and it's more grave um, impact on Japanese economy. So what uh, Japanese uh, have been doing, um, not because it's U.S.-China trade war, but uh, Japanese firms have been moving. Uh, their production out of China for some time ago, not not because this time. So the reason is because of the rising uh, labor cost, uh, and especially Chinese coastal cities, and then 25 uh, business tax is quite high, and then also a political risk. Uh, a Japan, Japanese firms are pretty aware of um, what happened in the past, and especially if you remember, um, this is the actual uh, uh, Japanese FDI um, to China and Southeast Asia. And then the line, it shows the Chinese uh, FDI to China. And then the bottom, uh, the, the graphs are for um, FDI on Southeast Asia. So if you look at it, it's steadily rising. But you know the time of 2011, 2012, the Chinese uh, FDI to China has has re reduced uh, substantially, and then it has been increasing in Southeast Asia investment. Do you remember what happened in 2012? Yes, exactly. So when the na uh, Japanese uh, uh, government nationalized Senkaku Island, uh, if you remember, uh, the Chinese, uh, China got so furious, and they had like nationwide anti-Japanese campaign, and then all the Japanese firms remember because you you know remember the the factory uh, the windows are broken and the department store is attacked, so you know the Japanese firms are well aware of what would happen if the, if something like that and then political risk is quite high so therefore they already have shifted uh, their product productions a lot to Southeast Asia, so what's happening now is that actually Chinese firms are moving their production to Southeast Asia. And this is a graph for uh, their FDI to Vietnam and Indonesia. So past 17 years is like quite remain minimum, but just only a year alone, 2018, 2019, they have a substantial uh, uh, shift of production to Vietnam and Indonesia. And as a result, uh, export from Vietnam is increasing a lot to the US. So that's what happening and um, so, but if you think about, you know, if U.S. really want to change this uh, def U.S. deficit, you want to reduce the U.S. deficit, but this is very structural. Uh, I think U.S. has been uh, having this problem for a long time, even they had uh, tr uh, trade negotiations with Japan. But this may be not the real motivation, because if U.S. want to reduce this, uh, the U.S. deficit, you have to change the, the consumption-led uh, economic structure, which I, I don't see any art, I mean, discussion about changing American lifestyle. So, which means that, you know, if you redirect, if you, you know, uh, reduce the, the, the export from China to the U.S., then the rest of the, the deficit comes from different countries. So, therefore, as the, the U.S. deficit as a total has actually increased uh, for the last uh, couple of years. And then also what happening is like a country like Brazil, uh, they're exporting to United States and China. So therefore their uh, uh, increase in, in the export is, is rising. And then so you know, that's what the not only Brazil but other nations are also exporting China and the US. And that's what's happening. So this is not you know, reducing just the U.S. deficit, it's more of a hegemonic war, and uh, the U.S. response respond to the rise of the Chinese uh, power, the, the threat 
of the you know, possibility that the China uh, super uh, see the US and that's uh, causing this kind of um, friction and the first phase is trade war but another one is 5G, we have many coming. And so like, uh, if you look at 5G, you know, Alexander mentioned, you know, the, the US has passed National Defense Authorization Act last year and it pressures US allies to confirm the rule. And Japan and Australia said, okay, you know, they agreed to exclude Huawei from their government procurement, but the other nations are unclear about that. And then especially the, the real challenge is that large part of the global uh, 5G infrastructure is already planned and already uh, developed in certain um, levels. So therefore, it's quite difficult to exclude Huawei uh, product from their, their infrastructure and especially private sector. And then also, um, as also Alexander mentioned, there is no real competitor at this moment uh, to, to replace Huawei product. And that's the real challenge. So US uh, China is, is fighting multi-front war, and if you just list a uh, couple of fronts, which one is a you know, technology front, uh, strengthening X control, as Alexander mentioned, and then also you know, National Defense Authorization Act, Huawei and ZTE, and then security front, also US had uh, this Taiwan Travel Act, enable exchange with the government officials on face of Chinese government and excluding China from RIMPAC, which is a, a large uh, US-led maritime warfare exercise. China was a part of it, and but now China is excluded. And also Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, uh, this is to strengthen ties with Taiwan and Asian nations. And also uh, US conducted Operation Freedom of Navigation on South China Sea. And also OPIC, which is the uh, newly uh, approved US government uh, institution to advance uh, foreign policy and national security priority to counter Chinese activity in developing nations. And if you look at the investment currency uh, front, uh, strengthen CFIUS review process, and also uh, designating China as a currency manipulating nation. So there are multi-front war which is happening, it's just a part of it. So what's coming is more wave of protectionism, you know, not only all the economy, which include agriculture, um, uh, materials and chemical machines, but new economy, including IT, and there'll be more quarters and higher tariffs and services for domestic industries. But, you know, G20 or APIC and those uh, institutions are not functioning properly. And also we're seeing uh, issue of Taiwan and North Korea exacerbating trade friction may trigger further, you know, more uh, US-China confrontation, which is uh, maybe coming soon. So what's Japan's challenge is, you know, on front of this exacerbating US-China trade friction, should Japan follow uh, US as has been? And uh, even Japan shares the same, uh, you know, value is it the, the case that Japan has to follow all the way? Uh, it um, needs to be discussed. And then also Japan's challenge is the, the Chinese economic plunge as well as slowing down the global economy. And then we're already seeing the Chinese production growth is down to a level of post uh, Lehman shock. And unemployment rate is rising. So it's gonna be a very uh, scary uh, uh, moment for Japan that if this is coming, and also dealing with the U.S. demand, um, you know, National Defense uh, Authorization Act is also one, but the other is a U.S. Japan bilateral trade. Um, Japan is kind of conceding to the United States, having considered the U.S. Japan Security Alliance that you know that Japan will be protected because of that. So they're kind of um, you know conceding, but you know, is this uh, is this uh, um, how to, to challenge or the, to respond to the US demand is also a challenge for Japan. And lastly, uh, regional security concerns. US pays no attention to uh, North Korean short range missile, which is a big, big concern for Japan. And also worsening of uh, South Korean Japanese relations is a problem. We don't see uh, any way out at this moment. And in Hong Kong escalation, it might be potential to Taiwan issue. So I will stop here and then I'll give it to Robert. Thank you very much. I'll just thank you very much, Hiromi Sensei, and thank you, Alexander Sensei. Uh, I'll just make a few comments and then open this up to, to the floor. I'm happy to see that even though we've moved outside of the Amanote line, we have a very large audience, probably reflection of the fact that you both are speaking. Um, you know, when you when you mention China's uh, counter sanctions or counter reactions, of course, 
they're the unofficial, unstated ones. I mean, if we think of the Huawei case, I mean, the prime example is that Beijing took two Canadian citizens as hostages, essentially. I mean, after Sabrina Meng uh, was arrested in Canada following a U.S. extradition request, uh, two Canadian citizens were detained and have yet to be heard from. Uh, so there's, there's a way Beijing can do this. Uh, without writing laws and regulations. So there's an above board and there's an under the waterline uh, aspect to the Chinese retaliation. I think you, know, you mentioned FedEx. Uh, it so happens that a FedEx uh, pilot uh, in China was arrested. And the allegation was that he was carrying 683 air pellets for some air gun, which do seem a little strange. I mean, that's possible, but it's also quite conceivable that this was uh, PRC retaliation against FedEx. Interestingly enough, I mean, the, the pilot's a retired U.S. Air Force colonel. Uh, and I think to, to go back to Hiromi Sensei's presentation, I mean, one, one problem, of course, that Japan, I think, is facing is that uh, under the, the current U.S. administration, the uh, policy of being more aggressive towards China was designed without taking into account that it should be done with allies. I mean, in other words, Japan is also facing the fact that the U.S. didn't sign on to TPP, uh, hang the possibility of uh, tariffs on Japanese auto imports that may or may not have been solved during the current uh, situation. So in some ways, Beijing was probably lucky that Trump was elected because a harder line against China was coming in the U.S. I mean, there was a growing consensus in both parties that the U.S. had to be tougher on China, whatever tougher means. But I think any other administration, either a Clinton administration or that of another Republican president, would have said, well, the U.S. is going to confront China as part of an alliance. Uh, and instead it hasn't, which in many ways has helped the PRC because it's facing the U.S. that, yes, the Trump administration considers China to be hostile, which is something that's shared by most American policymakers, but it also considers Mexico, Canada, the European Union, Japan, and basically the entire world to be an enemy of the United States. So that, to some extent, deflects a lot of the pressure on the PRC. Uh, we almost reached the end. Do you want to say something? Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank Anais and our student workers for organizing all this. Uh, I would like also to remind you to fill out the, the forms, the evaluation forms. And uh, why don't you show the ballot box? Here it is. Here it is. That's our ballot box. It's not a tainted election. There's no voter suppression here. Uh, so do vote. Vote often. Vote early. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Romy. Thank you, Alexander.